On September 11, 2005, Judy Bedard and her partner Rudy were diving in Eagle's Nest sinkhole, enjoying the clear blue underwater paradise. The bright limestone walls stood out to them as they descended slowly together. Being experienced divers, they had a clear plan and route to follow. The pair continued to descend until they reached 130 meters, where the entrance room split in two directions. At this moment, a technical issue was noticed with Judy's oxygen tank. Over the next 30 minutes, a race against time began, creating one of the most intense but rewarding cave diving stories known today. This is their story. The Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is located in the Chassahowitzka Wildlife Management Area in West Central Florida. From the outside, the water and the surrounding area look underwhelming. The entrance is rough and the dirt roads look plain, making the sinkhole seem uninviting. The surface water is dark green, like an old pond. It looks unappealing, almost like a place where you might find alligators, mosquitoes, or ticks. However, the surface can be misleading because as soon as one enters the water, they will discover a beautiful and vast cave system. For divers, Eagle's Nest is a paradise with amazing underwater caverns. It is often considered to be the Mount Everest of cave diving due to its depth and mile-long structure. The tunnels and caverns that make up the system can vary in size and length. As one enters the cave, the path will open up on either side of the diver. One direction will lead upstream and the other downstream. Depending on the direction one chooses, you may have to swim with or against the current, which of course will affect the amount of oxygen one plans to bring on the dive. In each direction, many tight squeezes will lead to more open areas, so divers must have the proper gear and training to navigate the tunnels. The entrance room, otherwise known as the ballroom, has a depth of about 150 meters before splitting off and leading the diver to either direction of the cave they choose. This is where you will find the famous Grim Reaper sign before going any further. From that sign, the entrance splits into two smaller passageways. These caves can go as deep as 300 feet, or 91 meters in some places. The visibility in the sinkhole changes depending on the Florida aquifers and recent rainfall. Before you enter the water, divers can look at the message board which will show the different conditions other people have experienced, from perfect visibility to almost no visibility. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is a prime example of dangerous beauty. Its surface might not reveal the stunning sights that lie within, but once you venture into its depths, you will see an underwater paradise. The cave's intricate passages and chambers showcase the wonders of nature, but they also pose significant risk to explorers. Both amateur and experienced divers have died here, and it is advised to consult with an experienced individual before entering. On September 11, 2005, Judy Bedard and her longtime partner Rudy Banks prepared for an exciting adventure at Eagle's Nest Sinkhole. Judy Bedard at the time was a 48-year-old experienced cave diver and a registered nurse who had gone on many diving trips with her friends. At 4.30 p.m., Judy and Rudy put on their gear and prepared their oxygen tanks for the dive. Once they were ready and each had an understanding of the dive plan, they entered the dark green water. They moved slowly through the cave, descending into the ballroom. The water was clear around them as the limestone rocks stood out on all sides. Judy used an oxygen-only tank until she reached a depth of 30 feet. Then she switched to her nitrox tank, which is a mix of nitrogen and oxygen. This switch was important because divers need different gas mixtures at different depths. Depending on the depth of the dive, the concentration of oxygen can play a crucial role in the safety of the dive. These different mixes can extend bottom times, reduce inert gas narcotic effects, and reduce decompression times. The dive was going well until Judy and Rudy reached 130 feet. At that depth, Judy started having technical problems with her tank. She had to switch to her trimix tank, which had a mix of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium needed for deep dives. But the gas mixture in this tank was wrong. Judy quickly noticed the problem It was forced to switch back to her nitrox tank. Judy and Rudy, feeling uncomfortable with the situation, both decided it was time to ascend. 
Due to the issues with Judy's tanks, they would need to surface quickly. However, divers must take the necessary safety stops on their ascent to avoid decompression sickness, also known as the bends. In diving, ascending slowly is important to prevent gas embolism, where bubbles or blood clots block blood flow. The pair moved as quickly as possible, but time was quickly running out. Judy's breathing began to get heavier and heavier as Rudy kept giving her worried glances. She had been getting almost no oxygen and too much helium because of the mix-up with her main tank. The air bubbles around them floated upwards as they reached 100 feet, when all of a sudden, Judy would pass out. Rudy at this point was extremely worried, but he kept a level head and noticed Judy was still breathing, so there was no reason to panic just yet as he continued to drag her to the surface. Everything was going okay, well, kind of, until it wasn't. At 60 feet, Rudy noticed that the only sound was coming from him. Judy had stopped breathing. Rudy wasn't sure what to do at this point, and he felt panic. They were still 60 feet below the surface, and Judy was now in critical condition. If they ascended quickly, she might get decompression sickness, but if they ascended slowly, she would likely die from lack of oxygen. Within a few seconds, Rudy made his decision. The duo began to rapidly ascend, ignoring the dangers of decompression sickness. He determined that she had a chance to survive with the bends, but if she had no oxygen, it was over. He quickly brought her to the surface and pulled her out of the water. She was not breathing. Rudy desperately needed help to revive her. James Gary, a member of the dive control board at the University of South Florida, and Greg Stanton, the former diving safety officer at Florida State University, saw what was happening and came to help Rudy. Unfortunately, the ascent caused a lot of problems and Judy's condition was dire. Judy also suffered from arterial gas embolism, which means air bubbles blocked her blood vessels. When she reached the surface, she had no pulse. Blood and foam were coming from her mouth. Her eyes were open. Dan Pellin, a visitor at Eagle's Nest, who was taking pictures, was stopped by James and told to call 911. Dan helped Rudy perform CPR on Judy, as Rudy looked anxiously at his partner's stone-cold face. Time stood still for 15 minutes until a miracle happened. Judy started breathing on her own. Although CPR brought her back to life, she remained unconscious and needed immediate medical help. Due to Eagle's Nest's remote location, this was hard to get. They had to drive through various dirt roads littered with potholes and tree debris. In Judy's case, not having the right supplies and transportation problems made things worse for the medical team. Without an IV drip, they had to rush Judy to the hospital using a backboard attached to an SUV. Ambulance and helicopter services were waiting at the edge of the woods nearby. Rudy was distraught and naturally couldn't relax because of Judy's condition. She was taken by helicopter to Shan's hospital, where her condition was critical. She was initially placed in a hyperbaric chamber, which is used to treat air embolisms. Even though she survived the first 24 hours, her condition got worse over time. This did not give experts much hope for her survival. After 24 hours, she was taken out of the chamber, but her condition would only get worse. Judy's kidneys would fail, and this would be followed by multiple heart attacks. Rudy was by her side through all of this, as he stayed positive for his partner's recovery. Judy was always known as a lively and happy person, so her friends and fellow divers took the news very hard. Judy would eventually be transferred by her family to Tampa General Hospital, where she could get better medical attention and have a more rigorous rehabilitation journey. In November, two months after the accident, she woke up. Judy recalled waking up unable to move with a tube in her throat and feeling weakness in her legs. It was a terrifying moment for her. While in the hospital, Judy had heart and lung problems, issues with her organs, memory loss, and a cognitive decline. People who go through such serious trauma usually have brain damage, trouble moving their arms and legs, and sometimes unable to move at all. Initially, Judy needed help to get in and out of bed. She couldn't keep her balance even with the walker and got tired after just 10 steps. Her rigorous physical therapy would go on for months. After about five weeks, she could walk over 300 feet. One doctor called her recovery nothing short of miraculous, and her physical therapist said it was one of the best recoveries they had ever seen. After reviewing the dive and its components, Stefan Farmer, a fish and wildlife inspector, said Judy's trimix tanks 
had gases mixed poorly, and the gas amounts in her tanks weren't checked properly. These problems contributed to her severe injuries. Judy had also forgotten to check the isolation valve, which connects the two tanks, leaving it closed. Experts said Judy was responsible for checking her equipment before the dive, and if she had checked the isolation valve, she would have seen that the tanks weren't pressurized equally and might have postponed the dive to fix these problems. Judy left the hospital in January 2006 and continued therapy for six more months to get stronger, more flexible, and better at moving. The next summer, she did something incredible, a dive in the Gulf of Mexico near Newport Ritchie with Rudy, who had become her husband. While she was in bed recovering, she often dreamed about diving. In June 2007, Judy went back to work at Tampa General Hospital, first as an operating room nurse and then in the medical records department. She chose not to work overtime so she could spend more time diving. Judy overcame her fears and started diving in underwater caves again, visiting places like Peacock Spring in North Florida.